microphone. Oops. Hello, welcome to another Cafe Rollist, and we're joined by a much more seasoned YouTuber than myself. And and Twitch, you do Ooh. Twitch, Paco? I don't even know. No, I actually haven't been able to get my hair around. I I I've done, I know I don't look like it, but I'm quite a lulite when he's about <laughs> these kind of technologies. Well, it's not. I mean, it's it's not rocket science. I know, but I've I've tried it. I really have, and uh, I did try to um, to stream uh, me doing a map and doing some coloring in Photoshop, and for some reason it didn't work out. I tried in YouTube, and it for some reason worked out. And I thought, you know, no one's gonna watch this anyway, so why? <laughs> Bother. And I just continue with YouTube. So but I, I, I should, I should definitely take a look at Twitch and, and upload the videos. What I uh, tried with this cool. one is having stream at the same time on YouTube, uh, and then it didn't work, and uh, I cannot be bothered. <laughs> it's, uh, it's I, but the things I'm cursed because I also tried OBS, which everybody seems to be. Oh, OBS is wonderful. It's oh, that's fantastic. what I'm using right now. The the thing I'm looking at is OBS. It doesn't work for me. I tell you, oh, why don't you capture, please? Because I always say, please, I'm very polite like that. I say, can you please capture this bit of the screen? Yeah. Can, can you capture Skype? No. <laughs> well, no. well, the Zoom one, I need to I need to reshape it each time. Uh, I participated at a convention. They, they use another software, which seems interesting, in combination with OBS. Uh, mm -hmm. They use it for the chat room and then they did the audio in Discord, which by the way I tested lately. The audio on Discord is really good because they got algorithms and stuff already cleaning the, the sound for you. So oh, okay. I should actually use that for, for this stream, but uh, as I'm working with different guests each time, uh, trying to explain Discord with different people who is not their main concern, uh, yeah, it cannot be bothered. <laughs> This code is a funny thing because although it, I have to say it also took me a while to get to grips with it until I understood that it's like the very old IRC chats from, you know, 25 years ago. And it's very similar, but a lot more sophisticated. As soon as it, that clicked, I was quite happy to use it. But until then, it was a bit... I'm I'm not a big fan of Discord because it's a bit like Twitter on uh, on drugs because the it just goes so fast you most Discord at least you cannot really follow a discussion before Discord most uh, even my podcast we had a Slack and the RPG Academy we had a Slack and I'd like Slack much better because it would keep conversation in packets so you could leave a conversation then come back and fight it again and resume it rather than on Discord I post something and then people post something about another subject and what I posted is, is lost, even if people mm. reply. So it's a bit too now. It's it's more it's more a chat thing than a discussion thing, I guess. It, it's for it's for gaming. But uh, but no, yeah, they, they got nice functions like the thing you did with the you wanted to do with the map, you could eventually do it because within Discord itself you can stream on Discord a, not only your your audio in a chat room wh which people can join freely but even stream a screen on it so mm -hmm. I started uh, sharing my screen when I'm editing sometimes and people can even hear what I'm editing somehow something I, I did not manage to do with, with OBS yet and it's, yeah, it's quite straightforward I, I, need, I need to investigate a little bit more but the thing is, is, is something that because I already produce so much content and I'm constantly trying to do things work and I try to play with my friends and I want to read and watch some television. Whenever I have to invest any time in learning something new, unless I I can see results pretty much right away, I I said no, okay, this is this is not for me. I, I, I don't have five hours to to try and find this if I don't know what I'm gonna get out of it. So if I try something like it happened with Twitch and I don't get my head around it right away. I just go to do some what I'm already doing and produce content some other way until eventually I say, okay, I'm gonna have another go. And then it clicks and then I kick myself in the ass for not trying sooner. Yeah, it's difficult. Again, I, I've heard about, and I've even used, helped by other people, stuff which worked better than what I'm using, but 
Yeah, it's it's difficult sometimes to invest the time uh, in things. Speaking yes. of time, or ice breaking question is: uh, Has your routine changed uh, recently uh, because of the COVID nineteen? Um, some of it actually has um, quite a lot. Not not because of me. You know, I've been very privileged that I've been able to keep working during this time. So at least two or three days a week, I've been able to go to the office. So even though it's not too far from home, but I go out and I jump in the tube and I see the empty streets. And that's been eerie. That's been really weird. Um, but that, that was fine. But my husband, uh, he couldn't go out. He was literally trapped in, in Valencia, uh, in our home. And the only thing he could do was literally go shopping. So the weekends have been really strange because not being able to go out hiking or to see my friends. I haven't played around the table with my friends since the beginning of March. I don't think I have ever been in my life, well, since I started playing role playing games, I don't think I've ever been that long without playing a role playing game around the table. So that, that's been really weird. Very, very strange. So you say around the table, does that mean you've been playing online? Or? We tried. We tried, but um, the group of people we play, we we can be up to eight people. Oof, yes, yeah, that's tough. Very tough. But also, we can be very unruly. So um, if we're playing around the table, it's, it's kind of okay because we all have a role to play. Um, not just our characters, but around the table. So, for example, I am the cartographer of the group, and I have another friend uh, who is the rules master, and somebody else uh, who is in the military is the tactician. Cool. And somebody else is the person who is looking at the, the spells and keeps track of what spells have been played or not, and the rounds, the initiatives, that sort of thing. So we're all doing something at some point or another. We're no bored or stopping. But when we do that around, um, you know, an online platform, we cannot do that that easily. So we talk and we get distracted by other screens. And the GM said, you know what, this is not working for me. I can play, but I cannot direct. I'm kind of the game's master uh, playing online. So we're going to wait until we come back to continue with the adventure. So, Yeah, eight people online, especially online. Uh, already live, it's, it's quite a, a challenge, but uh, online it's pretty much impossible. I find the, the sweet spot is three or four players. Uh, I just left the table. One of the reasons why I left the table was we were five players. I thought it was already too much, and then the, the game master enrolled a six player without consulting us uh, and I was like yeah no it's not it's not working I'm not connecting to be in the because, because even the, the the game master the practice was to make a lot of side talks so we were mm. using discord it would take the person to a, another chat room to discuss thing with them and then come back which I'm not against side talks I, I like using them personally but uh, yeah it, it it needs to be well written, and again with and six what, people. Pfft. What do you do meanwhile? That's the problem. That's why I don't. I'm not particularly keen on, uh, you know, online side talks. You know, because if it lasts five minutes, what do you do in the meantime? I mean, are you just check more things, and then you have to shut up, or you get distracted with another website, or go onto Twitter or Facebook or what have you? And it's a bit. You don't know how long it's going to last. So you don't know if you have enough time to take a loo break, for instance, or to go and grab a snack. Because if you do and you come back and everything has started or people are waiting for you, I don't know, it's, it's, it's messier. It's a little bit messier. Maybe it's just that I don't have enough experience, but to me, it feels messier. It's funny because at the same time, that's why I appreciate with online. I find that when people, when, when there's a scene involving not, not everyone at once, if you're around the table or if someone you know, is getting a, a drop of energy and availability for the game for a second because, you know, a game can take se usually take several hours, so you're not 100% all the time. I personally find that online you're less disruptive of the game when you're like, okay, I'm going to tune out for a second, I'm going to go to the bathroom or do something. It's less disruptive for, for the other players. So actually, that's a bit I like rather than dislike about things. 
But yeah, the number, it, it's just the math of it. If you have three players and you make five, seven minutes signed talks with even each of them, we're talking 20, less than 30 minutes and it, it's it's fine. It's, um, it's even less. It's, it's, 50, it's less than 15 minutes in which you are not playing. But if you, you've got six players, it's just it's just a nightmare. Even just taking turns. Also, it was a system sort of inspired by Pathfinder, and we had a a mission investing a place. We were FBI agents. It was a exercise in saving um, an hostage from from a kidnapping. But uh, a turn by turn action with six people. It's like. <laughs> By the time you got your own turn, you 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 fallen asleep. Yeah, it can it can drag an awful lot. But uh, so, would you say online stuff is that uh, is that a new skill or are there hobbies or skills you picked up while uh, in uh, the current situation? Although you you you're not no. short of work. No, I'm not sure of work, but um, I mean I've, I've taken advantage to do an awful lot of things that um, otherwise. I wouldn't have done. For instance, I've picked up on, on the number of maps that I had to draw for, for my friends, and um, I've managed to improve enough that some people are saying, you should put those maps out there. So, you know, I'm fine, I'm going to put them in Patreon and see what happens, um, you know, and see if people will be keen on them. But people seem to be liking them when I show them on Facebook. So I'm enjoying to be able to say, you know, these three hours, these are going to be for me to sit down, television in the background, you know, while, while Martin is watching the telly, and we are watching the telly, but it's something that I can be doing while, you know, I look at the screen, and then I look down, and look at the screen, and I don't have to rush it, I don't have to stress about it, I just do it. And, uh, and I'm loving it. I really am loving it quite a lot. Um, I've managed to finish writing, uh, sorry, correct, uh, proofreading the translation of my book that's going to come to Kickstarter in the next few weeks as well. Wow, cool. Um, so, yeah, no, I've, I have done other things that because I couldn't record videos like I normally do, um, you know, because here I come to the studio and I can spend five hours recording videos at home. It just doesn't feel right. Um, so I've been doing other things. So I haven't picked up a new hobby, so to speak, but I have consolidated a couple of projects that I really wanted to get my hands on, uh, and I didn't have the time to do then. Now it's going to be the challenge of how do I keep them up? Mm, yeah, yeah, that's that, that's something I'm wondering about when, when I resume work when we stop lockdown uh maybe i will have a window when my son will be back in nursery but i'm still at home but uh besides that yeah i started this stream i don't i'm not sure it will be it will survive the end um, of this which is certainly not a something important in the grand scheme of things but uh still it's fun to to engage with people like that what, what's the title of your book actually i'm not aware of that because I'm the most unaware um, podcaster of the hobby. Well, um, I I have been a publisher in Spain for a while. Uh, I stopped publishing books in in Spain last year um, because I had a, a huge amount of problems um, with um, with the audience. Um, it just I wasn't really gelling with them. They weren't really gelling with me, uh, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to quit this. Um, I had some problems with online harassment and a troll that just was completely hellbent on on killing absolutely anything and everything I did. Uh, I made some mistakes as well. Working alone, you make some mistakes. You don't realize that things go out and they're not the quality that they should be. And I thought, I'm going to stop publishing because this is not giving me any money. And it's not giving me any joy. But I have some, some books I wrote. Um, Cthulhu-based books that I thought, okay, let's let's try this. So I started translating them. And um, the first book that's going to come out is called Campo de Mythos, um, an hour of field of mythos, um, which is it's a campaign setting, um, system agnostic for the time being, for Cthulhu games. 
um, it's very much inspired. You remember Cubicle 7 had um, Cthulhu Britannia? Yep. It's very much inspired in that. Um, I, I liked those books because they brought the mythos away from the United States and away from Miskatonic, um, you know, Arkham, those places, which I know people are going to hate me for saying this, but I'm bored of saying this. I really am bored with them. You know, I don't, I don't want to see Arkham again. I don't want to see the Miskatonic University again. I want to see other things, other places. And um, we are very privileged in Europe that we have thousands of years of history, legends, myths, traditions, you know, folklore. And I thought, you know, what about if I try this uh, in my hometown? Um, I, I come from the south of Spain, a little place called Algeciras, which is immediately opposite Gibraltar. And um, my, my town, which right now is a horrible place, you know, incredibly industrial, it's, it's, it's ugly, it doesn't really have much to go for it. But if you look at its history, it used to be such a cool, amazing place. And we still have some traditions in there that looking at them think, that's weird. Yeah. This is bizarre. So I thought, okay, what, what if I take, you know, those myths, the people I know in town, the people I grew up with, what if I take those people and bring them to the 1920s and rewrite them as, you know, mythos kind of characters. And I started to write. And um, before I realized I have 45,000 words written, you know, I had nice. some, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, it was quite, oh, wow, well, I man, this, this is a lot. Um, it was meant to be an adventure. I mean, they just kept growing and growing and growing and growing. And I, and I thought, you know, I have the history of my town. I have an alternative history. I have 27 locations, you know, shops, the tailor, the bakery, churches, the council, and every location has at least two or three characters, you know, NPCs. Each one of them has three different attitudes, depending on whether they're friendly or neutral or the, if they are antagonistic. And I thought, yeah, I think I'm gonna publish this. Um, because it, I, I don't know, it feels like something different. And people who really think it's, yeah, pretty cool. So I'm, I'm quite hopeful that this is going to be a very, very nice looking book. That sounds exciting. Have you drawn a map for it already? No, um, I commissioned, because I published a book in Spanish. I, I commissioned um, some illustrations from an artist the, who lives in, uh, in Ibiza. And uh, luckily, because it's so long ago, I've managed to find a lot of photographs of the town from the early 20th century that are copyright free and I can use them without an issue. That's um, cool. I also found some photographs of some people who um, descendants are still alive. So I was able to, you know, fairly small town. So you, you know, somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who can introduce you. So I was able to go and say, hey, look, you know, I've seen this photograph of your granddad, who used to teach at this school. I'm using this school. Uh, look, this is what I've written. And I would like to use this photograph of your granddad. And she came back to me and said, oh, that's my granddad. And that's my mom. Yeah, 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 please use the photograph. That, that would look very cool. Let me know when it's published. I thought, OK, that's brilliant. That's really, really brilliant. So um, I think that gives a sense of authenticity to the whole thing rather than uh, maps being drawn or anything. I, I can actually use real maps. I may still draw some maps for them. So for instance, um, there is a church um, that no longer exists. Uh, or that is very different today as it was uh, in 1920. So um, I may draw a map for that. That sort of thing I, perhaps I, I shall do if, if we get enough money for it. But the book as it is, it already is looking, yeah, very, very cool. Um, I'm, I know it's bad of me to say this, but I'm quite proud of it. That sounds cool. And I think it's great to see projects like that, even uh, 
published by Chaosium. I haven't had a read yet, but uh, uh, Wicked Berlin, I'm I'm all for it. Something like that, having uh, the mythos brought in uh, in 1920s Berlin. Uh, I know well, Reign of Terror set in France, and I know the 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 publishers in France. Not only the, the publisher, I don't remember their name. Uh, maybe Arcan, but the yeah, they're publishing the official Chaosium content in French. They're translating it, but they're also creating content which should be brought to the English-speaking audience uh, by Chaosium. So, so it's nice to see the meters, yeah, take different shades of colors and environment, and you you can play where wherever you you want and whenever you want also. Yeah, I mean, it would be great. I mean, I've already spoken to Kaosian um, about it um, because, you know, they, for being one of the largest companies in, in the RPG industry, they're also one of the nicest. I mean, yeah, they're, they're very approachable. I mean, they're crazy yeah. approachable. They're lovely. They really are lovely. So I'm, I've spoken to them and said, look, I, I want to do this. Yeah, so you know. So if you're interested or what have you, let me know. But, you know, We'll see in the future what what comes from it because I have so many ideas. Um, I, I'm already outlining what the next book is is going to be, um, you know, and there's so many so cool stuff that could be done, and even transfer to different countries if, if you wanted to, you know, for for people who wanted to to play, you know, in in the United States, um, for instance, or France or whatever. You know change the name of the town, change the name of, to make it sound English or French or German or anything at all, that's it, done. There you have it. So there are an awful lot of very, very cool things that could be done. And I'm, I'm quite excited about the possibility of bringing that kind of content out there and having people play it. So you, you mentioned 1920s, which is not quite what I'm, I'm going to say, but uh, Spain, the mythos, uh, it makes me think of uh, El Labyrinth del Fono, uh, Pan's Labyrinth, and it also because I'm uh, I'm into I, I got a special interest in, in Spanish history or at least uh, 1930s history. Uh, are you your your game is 1920s, but it's a it's a very specific time and place in the history of the world 19 and a place which is not really covered uh, in history book as much. Uh, as it should be. So, are there specific elements of of that history and the politics of the time which sort of seep through? I know you're sensible to a number of of questions regarding uh, uh, racism and uh, uh, openness to to different things. Uh, without going, I know you had a, a long debate about uh, historical accuracy, quotation mark, and verisimilitude. Uh, but uh, are there, uh, yeah? Historical and political aspects of the time you you playing with in that se- with that setting with those adventures. Look, um, the, the way I like to define how I've written this book is historical fiction um, because I am mixing, for instance, uh, there is a bakery. Now that bakery called La Licantina, that bakery is a real place that you can go to today. You, you can find them online and then you can go and you can eat incredible pies and cakes and ice creams. I have taken the owner that saw me grow up. I mean, she saw me from when I was about this little to being the man I am today. I encarna and I have taken her to 1924. Um, I've taken my family and I've taken me back to 1924. So I'm mixing the future and the present. So people who read the book and go to my town or even go online, you know, they, you can go to, to Google Maps and you can find these places. But also, I decided that I wanted the history to be present in there. So um, in 1924, which is the, the exact year where this book is based, uh, Spain is in war with Morocco. Um, the Rift War is, is going on. So there are some aspects that I, I decided to keep. For instance, of the, the fisheries are very close because if you go out fishing, um, there could be some very serious conflict if you happen to find a Moroccan boat in the middle of the Atlantic or the Mediterranean. So it's a bit, you wouldn't want to go there. Um, even though there's always been a pretty heavy Arabic presence in my town, 
I took it all out because at that time there wasn't anything. Because, you know, Moroccans, they weren't welcome because we were at war with them. So I, I did, I decided to keep that sort of contextual accuracy to make sure that there wasn't anything that people would look and say, you know, this is not really appropriate. There will be more books, hopefully, in the future. For example, I want to make one about Ceuta, which is one of the two colonies that we still have in, in the north of, of Africa and Morocco. And that will have a much stronger influence. Um, I included in one of the adventures um, gypsy culture as well. Um, but I had to be very careful because I had to include it as it was then, but punching up. You know, it's, it's very easy to fall into stereotypes. Now, when we talk about stereotypes today, a hundred years ago, they were actually true. So I had to find a way to actually punch up to make sure that they weren't, you know, the bad of all jokes or they weren't misrepresented in any way or represented in a way that you look at them today and think, not a problem. So I, I did have to pay an awful lot of attention and care to it. Um, but, you know, I managed to include bisexual people and uh, women in power and weak men and mean men and mean women and mean gay people and heart like hearted bisexual people. I, I did out of the 80 characters, there is a huge amount of diversity and richness within that many people. And that is something I'm really, really proud of. It's yeah, it's it's a challenge because on the one hand you want to represent minorities, and on the other hand, when you're not part of the minority itself, the the appropriate way of doing so it's it's challenging. I mean, the on Monday we did not really discuss that that much with Helen last Monday, but she's a sensitivity uh, reader, so mm -hmm. she provides this kind of services. I mean, like for instance. Um, uh, I, I'm saying that because someone came back to us in film studies when you, we use the word. Uh, the G word is not appropriate. Uh, it's apparently, uh, yeah, it's not appropriate for, for with a number of people. And, I, I'm, and the last film, so we did a film studies about um, the Brotherhood of the, Hol the Wolf, a French movie, mm -hmm. and there, there were a lot of characters who, who look kind of Roma, so they, they were leading on to stereotypes. And now we just recorded a film studies, which is not out yet, about a movie which I recommend, which is uh, Black Cat, White Cat by Emir Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. A lovely movie set in a at the border between Bulgaria and Serbia. It's not quite clear. And yeah, a lot of, of the characters are, are Roma and they speak Roma, they, they speak a, a number of different languages. But yeah, when we covered the movie, I, I made a little search, and it was, yeah, it's a rabbit hole because you, the, the movie is I mean, for me, it's a rabbit hole. Um, it, for me, it's a very um, intricate subject because I am part gypsy. Oh, my, my, my great my great grandmother was was gypsy. Um, she married my my great granddad, and um, I just happened to have white skin privilege but you see other members of my family and you can see the genes in there um although if you ask the spanish gypsy they would say you are not really part of us because you don't share all of our culture you don't share our traditions you don't share our lifestyle you but they generally accept me mm -hmm. um so even though I do consider myself part, uh, part of me is part of the gypsy community, um, but I cannot claim to be a gypsy. However, in in Spain, the trend, what well, what it is trying to do right now is to eliminate the stigma of the word gypsy, because gitano yeah. is used as an insult, is is used as something bad and the the amount of discrimination of the gypsy community is ginormous so for 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 them for us for me the word gypsy is the word that we have adopted 
So I understand that some people take it as a slur. For us, it's not. It's like the gay community taking the queer, the word queer, and reclaiming it as you know, this is not something that should be an insult anymore. And I get the origin of the word gypsy is a misnomer of Egyptian. Um, and I, I understand that there are plenty of diversity within the community. But for me, uh, as a Spanish part gypsy person, I just don't have another word. I am not part Roma. Because people in my country, the ancestry is different, very, very different. And we are making a massive, massive effort in making sure that the word gypsy stops having the stigma it has. It, using it, I know that some people it irks them and it doesn't. They don't like it, and I'm truly sorry about that. But it's my word. I mean, I'm, I don't mean to be judgmental regarding that. It's just I did get the feedback from. I, did, I think what what's happening also, and sometimes it's. I mean, it's, it's difficult. It is difficult. It's challenging, uh, and it it's not just about. Uh, yeah, the gypsy community, uh, if you, you prefer me to, to call it that, is, the, is that things are happening at different speed and in different ways in different countries, yet we are connected by the internet. So a Spaniard or a French might today consider the word gitan or gypsy differently than a uh, American or even a uh, British one. Uh, the, would take it so it's very difficult somehow i find it's especially in well i'm uh, okay i'm white uh i'm baptist um father protestant mother catholic so i, I got f i'm full on white privilege uh i mean i'm not full on for it i'm, I'm full on a beneficiary of the white privilege so uh, i cannot say much about that but the, the thing which i noticed quite strongly is that the French speaking culture and Japan's got a f very strong relationship and in terms of appropriation for instance to, the, to talk about one thing there's a lot of appropriation going on between Japan and France and a lot of things could be questioned uh, but they're not really because both feel I guess I guess if I would m I guess there's no financial competition between the two one is not exploiting the other and both are cultures which have their their sphere of influence they, they don't feel threatened by one another but when you see things which are happening between French authors and Japanese authors and everybody's happy with that on both sides Japanese are flattered that the French would do uh, their own manga and the French are flattered that the Japanese would do something uh, with Arsène Lupin or uh, yeah you know characters from France uh, when those things arrive in the realm of uh, Asian communities in the US, they take that in a very different way because their reality is very different than the one from the French or the Japanese living in Japan. So it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult how, or to balance that and how you, re you remain, I guess, faithful to, to where you come from and your, your ideas while engaging with an audience and trying to, yeah, I guess it's about being pedago pe uh, pedagogical with them, you know, trying to, to explain your position. I, I agree. And I think it's also a matter of being flexible. I mean, for instance, I don't mind being called gypsy. But if I was talking with a Roma person and said, don't call me gypsy, I wouldn't dare. You know, I wouldn't impose on them. No, you, you are gypsy. I'm, no, I mean, you don't want me to call you that. That's absolutely cool. Totally respectful. Uh, you want me to, you want to call me something else? You tell me what, but my, my word is this. <laughs> respect that too you know i think it's a matter of respecting each person's boundaries each collective boundaries understanding that people culturally leave things very very different and even though we are internet centric we are not ourselves centric and we need to understand that we just have to get to know and understand that people find offensive things that other people don't find offensive. Um, you know, on, on the culture appropriation things, um, Japan, funnily enough, is also very keen on flamenco. We invented flamenco. Flamenco is, is part of our gypsy culture. Some people see that as really, really bad. See a, a flamenco dancer from Japan or a you know flamenco guitarist, Japanese flamenco guitarist. I love it. You know, I absolutely love it. I would have an issue 
if I had a Japanese person coming to me and saying, this is my culture. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, yo, <laughs> wait a minute. No, 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 no. This is my culture and you're borrowing it and you're doing something beautiful with it. And I love it. But it's not your culture. This is my culture. You know, it would be like me dressing up as a samurai and saying, oh, this is my culture. No, no, not at all. So I, me personally, I know some people object to it a lot. I personally don't because I love beauty and I love to see, you know, people playing beautiful music and dancing beautiful dances. And if, you know, my culture has managed to contribute something to somebody else's life that makes them happy, I'm okay with that. I have no issues. Tony, uh, stuff like flamenco, I find it fascinating. Uh, because, uh, again, uh, I'm quite into history and uh, what I find fascinating, so, okay, <laughs> interesting, all things uh, which ruffle people can be very personal. I don't like being called Belgian. And I've been telling that to, to people because I, I, I wasn't happy there and uh, I don't identif identify uh, as such anymore. Uh, I understand it's very different than uh, being a part of a min oppressed minor minority, but you know, personal thing. Someone tells me, I'm like, oh, no, please don't refer to me a a as such. But at the same time, I'm really fascinated with the history of the area and the fact, and it's part of my frustration with Belgium, to be honest, the fact that people don't know their history and don't know, for instance, that we've been, well, we've, okay, uh, Belgium has been, or the, the area of Belgium has been Spanish for at least as long as there's be, they've been French, for instance. And it, it the, you know, the, and the time when we were a part of, of the same kingdom was a, a fascinating time of history. And I always thought it was fascinating. And maybe you know more than, well, you probably know more than me about that. But flamenco, the, is the word, does the word come from Flemish? And do you know why it would? I have no idea. I, am, I must admit, I have no clue. I know it comes from Flemish. Um, and I know that um, one of our emperors was, you know, um, emperors of I don't know how many places. Yeah, a couple, uh, yeah. But I, I cannot say I know with any certainty. So I don't know where it comes from, um, because the roots of flamenco music have been traced back all the way to India. Wow. So it, it comes, that, that's why we know that th there is a connection between Spanish gypsies and India from hundreds of years ago. I mean, the, the first record of, of gypsy people in Spain officially comes from Cervantes, who describes um, gypsies as perceived to be, uh, you know, happy go live kind of care carefree uh, roguish people and by then um, they already had that reputation in Spain so it's not really known when gypsy people arrived in Spain but it must have been at the very 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 least 500 years at least if not more than that but and we know, yeah, it's been traced to, to India, but I don't know enough about it. Much too much shame it, to learn about that. Just, I just find that time fascinating because it's a time of of cities uh, and uh, of network and exchange, and it's such an influential time. And uh, what, what I find fascinating is how you see those countries, those regions like Flanders, they they even their food still today there's a lot of stuff they they got spices and cinnamon and flavors that you don't find in in french cuisine uh, as much so so where does it come from uh, it probably comes from that 15th century 15 16 uh, my history is is lacking trade and i guess maybe it, it was called uh Flemish flamenco because it, it was a way to say foreign then you know when you talk about something which is foreign and maybe the the traveler communities were literally already traveling the many roads connecting those uh, city states in the north and with the uh, with Spain. So yeah, they they were part of this trade. And you you, you know, there's other example of stuff like that when people call it uh, like it's romantic. 
uh, romantical, which most of the stuff romantical do, do not even come from Rome, but it, you just associate a word with saying foreign, like Orientalism and this. Well, it's, it's Oriental. Well, no, it's not because it's, it's from this area. It's just a word that people associate with, with foreign as a replacement for, for foreign, I guess. Uh, and I guess there must have been also an awful lot of confusions at the time. You know, maybe some people came from, you know, from Flanders. You know, and, oh, these people come from Flanders. Oh, what are they playing? Well, flamenco music because they come from there. And they didn't know that actually that's not really where they came from. They just happened to be passing by that place on their way. But uh, maybe it just stayed. And yeah. I, I don't know. I really have no idea. Well, history is full of stuff like that. On one hand, I love history and I love the idea of exploring history with role playing games. But what fa one thing I find people are missing when, when the debate about accuracy comes up is that we overestimate way too much how much we know about the past. Uh, uh, like another example of words which, which is pretty much meaningless at some point is Celt, because mm -hmm. Celt is a word to say the others but as not the Roman or the Germans it's the same it means well, we're the Romans they're all the Germans all of them from uh, from this place over there up to the north of there they're all Germans and it it doesn't mean anything uh, it's or goth uh, <laughs> you know how many goth families were hanging up uh, hanging out in Sicily and Spain and then formed families there it's just yeah people don't underestimate the confusion and also the movement of people across Europe, which yeah, I find it a pity. It's not it's not more explored in in cinema and entertainment, in role playing games, and even it's sadly very badly taught at school, which is most of the history textbooks are still nineteenth century oh, based. Huh? Well, I think um, I think history, at least the way it was taught in Spain, um, and I'm not by any means a uh, specialist because I used to have the sort of history teachers who would come into the classroom and say open the book for the page 13 you read yeah all the time so I, I just didn't learn history but what I learned from it and later on when I've actually started to do some some research and especially talking to to true historians is that the history that we have been taught at school has been sanitized, it's been simplified, and it has been redressed to make our countries, make our cultures look better than they actually were and glamorize the whole thing. Um, because we have no idea how many people died of scurvy in the Middle Ages. And, you know, the fact that if you broke a leg or if you had a cut, that was pretty much a life sentence because who on earth was going to disinfect something when you have no disinfectant? The fact that drinking water could be lethal. Was lethal. That, that's a bit I find absolutely fascinating how today we associate water with health and you go to the past, not even that far. I think you go World War Two, maybe World War One, maybe a bit earlier. Water is death. <laughs> <laughs> you and and not only water is death, but there's a oh, what is it called? There's a book and there's also an episode of Dan Carlin about that. It's called uh, History Under the Influence, and it was an historian trying to work out. Okay, we keep wondering about why this general t took that decision there, or why did people behave this way there? Because everybody was high. All the time. All the time. Because, and it was not a bad thing. It was the only alternative they had because that was the only thing which would not kill them. You could not go to the river or the well and pick a bucket of water mm -hmm. and even just boil it. it. It was not enough. And yeah, there's another episode I really recommend. I love this show. It's called How It Began by Brad Harris. And there's an episode about coffee. It, it's very, it's interesting because it's a, it's a history show, but... He, he puts the narrative on top of his episode, so it's it's not pretending to be objective too much, but it, it comes up with an interesting story. It's it's good for photo, and one of the theory of that episode about coffee is that until we had coffee, people when they would socialize or drink anything, it would always be alcohol, mm. and and having coffee and then coffee places or coffee just 
events at your home, people coming up for coffee. Well, it was in part to thank for the part of the enlightenment and this sort of things because suddenly people would meet, gather and socialize without getting drunk. So they would start thinking instead and exchanging ideas. But yeah, even just to illustrate that fact that, yeah, uh, kids would drink beer. I mean, when I was a kid, I was served beer in Belgium uh, as kind of a remnant of a tradition. But kid would, kids would drink beer because it was, it was safer than water. Right. So we have all sorts of things like that, you know, but women who played roles that nobody had told us anything about. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we talk an awful lot of people. Um, history has a history of erasure. That's that's the fact. Yes. You know, that we have, they've taken away an awful lot of things from history, both good and bad. Um, they, they've taken away characters that uh, if you look back, you think, wow, where is where is the rest you know what else is there and you see an awful lot of people who played such important roles and we've forgotten them and we just they're just not there at all um because you know personally because i belong to the lgbt community you know there's been so much erasure of that it's, you read pretty much any history book and it's like there were no gay people there yeah. Um, and when you bring that topic out, oh, because, you know, they would be killed. No, actually, they would survive. They they survived. They were important, often. A lot of them were. Uh, like, yeah, yeah, but it's funny when how it's, you know, these ideas are so ingrained in us that the, we, we even project them. So I, ha I was having this conversation on Discord with, with someone a bit randomly on the uh, Basilisk Online Discord chat. The, some evening, Francita was a graphic designer from... Chile, she, while she works, she's got the chat room open so people can show up and, and just have to, a little chat. And I was discussing from with uh, a member of the uh, LGBTQ community there, and I was saying, well, I wish it would be great that there are more history-inspired, history-based role-playing game. And that person was telling me, no, I don't want to play something in the past because I want to play a gay character and this gay character could not do anything and would be oppressed and so on. And I was like, yeah, you're actually projecting a narrative which was forced onto us, which is not... I, I, want, to, I want to say to be polite, it's not entirely true. Actually, I think it's pretty much false. Uh, not everywhere, not all the time, maybe not in 19th century um, US or France, I don't know. But if, if you go in many, many places and times in history, there are a lot of very important LGBT uh, LGBT people, not only, but they are not, they are not necessarily closeted. I think that there were all societies which were more than fine with that, and it's, it's sad that even, yeah, even someone who identify as uh, gay or color, have been convinced by this big machine to which we're subject that that the way we are today is the way it's been all the time, forever, everywhere. Because it's, I don't think it's true. I think there are, there are professional historians who can tell you that it's not true. Well, to be honest, firstly, it's, it's, you're right, it's not true. It's, it's, I mean, yes, part of it is true, of course. And, and there were an awful lot of problems, and there were an awful lot of people who were killed. And yes, you probably had it harder. That doesn't mean that you were going to be instantly killed right away just because you, uh, you, you happen to be gay, I think. Um, few years ago, not long ago, a letter was discovered from King James I, I think, in the UK, addressing somebody as his husband. You know, we're talking somebody in 1600s. So, um, some things used to happen. However, in any event, it's a fantasy game. It doesn't matter how accurate or historically realistic you want a game to be. If you have a spell, if you have magic, if you have any sort of supernatural thing, it's fantasy. You can do anything you want, absolutely anything you want. If somebody tells you that you can't because historical accuracy, I'm sorry, that does bias. That's just that's you trying to silence people. That's not because you can't or you shouldn't. If you can have a dragon, if you can have a witch, if you can have a wizard, you can have a gay person or a trans person. Or, or a gender fluid person, you can. That that's it. So there should be absolutely zero limits to that in role playing games in any role playing game. 
Well, I, I don't quite agree with the idea of zero limits. Uh, I think the limits are just need to be agreed between the players and the game master. But where, where I agree with you is is generally when 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 the debate arrived. When I saw the debate arise, it, again it was a question of it was not actually accurate. It was an application of the bias from the game master or the person who wrote, wrote the story, who, in my experience, were not as hysterically literate as they were thinking they are they were so but yeah i don't have an issue with someone yeah playing some things uh, as long as people agree and as long things are not you know uh dressing on the thing like oh let's sprinkle a little bit of racism in this corner to make it more uh like this time no it's if you include racism or, or anything you, it, with some tables in the right condition, I think you can play with that. But I think it needs to matter. Right? But it means it needs to be addressed. It's not. It's not. It's not something to limit your options. It's something you're gonna engage with. I. I, I think. Uh, I think there are very good games which try to to do that and do do it well. From what I heard, uh, I haven't played that many of them, but. Uh, Night Witches, uh, as far as I know, there's the sexism in Night Witches and there's homophobia in Night Witches. There are, there are games which are designed like that, for that, like Rosenstrass, which is about anti-Semitism in, during World War II, so you're, you're spot on in the middle of, of the issue. Uh, uh, dogs in the win wine yard and, and this sort of thing. So I think I would, I'm, not, I'm a bit annoyed when people make blanket statements and say there shouldn't be never any racism in table roping game. I think personally table roping game are actually a good place to empathize with that and understand a bit more the dynamics which can be behind all this sort of things. Uh, so I'm not but yeah not not in D&D &D. that's not why I, I'm not on a hill defending the racist orc I'm like I know that that's rubbish but yeah, there's there's a whole spectrum of things and conditions in which you there are stuff which I find is appropriate personally or or not. Uh. Exactly. I mean that's that's what when I said there should be zero limits. I'm I meant in that kind of D and D sort of games you know, or in the Call of Cthulhu sort of games. You know, there should be absolutely zero reason why somebody shouldn't be able to play a gay character, you know, or, or a trans character. Why not? I mean, come on. Any any reason that anybody can come up with is likely to have a root in bigotry, even if that person doesn't know. It. And I agree with you. I think that there should be a place where people can actually play with, with racist stereotypes and, and racism. The problem with that is how do you do it to make sure that it doesn't perpetuate something outside the table and it's not going to harm anybody within the table? That is the problem. The, the thing I find problematic is that when people say, no, no, I, I want to be able to play this, it's not because it's going to add anything to the game itself, mm -hmm. the canon, the atmosphere, it's because they want to bring their own bias, their own races, their own bigotry to the game so they can keep behaving like this, or they can behave in the game the way they wish they could behave in real life. Yeah, the... the, the they consolidate bias which are in place. Uh, I guess an example is Haunted West, where you can play, which made a big deal of making people of color more visible in a wild Old West setting. And, mm -hmm. and then you run up into people who are like, the Old West was not like that. You cannot be a dark skin uh, cowboy. And you're like, ah, actually, <laughs> look at history. A vast number of people uh, Cowboys, so-called cowboys, whatever that that might be a cowboy is that literally someone. Uh, I'm not even sure it's appropriate term in uh, in English because that's what we use in French and 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 Spanish, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Because cowboy is actually a job; it's a farm a rancher. Yeah. I guess it's a rancher. But yeah, a lot of them were were Hispanics, were people of colors. So so what's inaccurate is the vision of the old, you know, John Wayne movie with. All the cowboys, they're, they're white and... Uh... But in, let's imagine for a second that it's all that is correct and true. Just for a second. Exactly what does that add 
to the game to keep it that way. Well, it depends. How does it make, how does it make the experience any better to, to tell people, no, no, you must play like this because that's how it was 20 years ago. Even if you play like this now and the game is not going to do any bad to the game. I, well, mean, I think there's two things. First, there's the dynamic of it's different when you say, no, you cannot play this. A game master says that to a player and for some reason, which are, I notice often uh, those two people really play together, although they, they don't agree on some things, which I, mm -hmm. I'm trying to describe. I think, okay, you need to find the what fit, uh, uh, what matches another. Uh, so so rather than the dynamic of you cannot or can't do this, it's more we agree that we're going to play in such context with such goals with that with that game. And then there's a difference between playing Haunted West, which is still mm -hmm. fantastical, but has a, a number of considerations in place. And I'm not the most aware of this game, so I don't know how much uh, racism is part or not of the narrative. Again, Night Witches would be more appropriate because this is part of the thing. I think, I think there's a difference between if you play Night Witches, which is a World War II playing f a women fighter pilot uh, yeah, bombing Germany, and it's part of the game to play a, a number of aspects, not everything accurate, but a number of aspects are, are part of the game, part of the, the experience which it offered to the to the author. And by the way, it's a question again of the players and the game master wanting to uh, embrace that because they don't have to. If they don't want to, they don't have to. There's a difference between playing that and playing a, I don't know, a, uh, yeah, playing Achtung Tulu in mm -hmm. in World War Two, and suddenly in Achtung Tulu you say, no, you cannot play, if, you, if you're a gay character, you're going to be the subject of homophobia in uh, in the Achtung Tulu. That's not the point of Achtung Tulu. So in Achtung Tulu, I would I would get rid of all of that because it's not it's not the game, the place, or the setting to to discuss racism or, or homophobia. It's not the sort of not the purpose of the game. So unless a very specific game master with quite good credentials in terms of discussing that would tell me, okay, my project is to do this and I want and those matters because I want to explore those notions. Uh, I would be interested in that in the same way that I like to watch Captain America and it's all action and doesn't matter and and I hope to see a lot of representation in Captain America and there should have been more and hopefully there will be more in Marvel uh, as we go along and there's a different and I can enjoy watching this movie and I can also quotation mark enjoy watching a movie which will be uh, I don't know Chindler's List because it, they serve a different purpose. One is pure entertainment, while the other has got a purpose of... It's still an experience I appreciate, for lack of a better word. It's an experience I seek, which is an experience of trying to heighten my awareness and my empathy towards the situation. You know, this idea of projecting yourself into somebody else's situation, which is sort of what movies do. And... Yeah, movies don't have... I mean, mo nobody would ever question... I think, Well, I guess some would. Movies can be... Can have difficult subjects. Uh, but but you you go see them with, with that in mind. And But yeah, if, if someone was coming to tell me in Captain America, characters should be more homophobic or Captain America seems to be tolerant of gay people. It comes from the 30s, doesn't make any sense. You're like... We don't give a shit about that. I mean, he's, he's freaking Captain America. He's running around, throwing a shield, which defied the, the laws of physics. So I just want this guy to be a very good guy, and by today's standards of being a very good guy, is very tolerant of uh, two men being married with one another. So, but also, what? How would that? How would having a homophobic Captain America make him a better character, or make it a better movie, or more interesting? But again, you know, yeah, no. What uh, does he add? It doesn't. It doesn't contribute anything to it at, at all. No, so why uh, bother? Yeah, you wouldn't bother with Captain America, but again, you might bother with uh, not specifically homophobia, but Marvel Man or the boys, because it's the point of the story. It becomes uh, the point of the story. That's not. That's not a thing on the side. It's the point of the story. Yeah, but that's exactly. But that, that's a different thing. That would add to the story. For instance. If if Marvel Man in, in um, I, I kind of 
in, uh, in the boys. Um, you know, the mega superhero who's indestructible, or Superman equivalent. If he happens to be a homophobe, I would understand perfectly. And it will add the story because it goes with its character. It, it, it really fits perfectly with the character. So it would make the story richer. It would yeah. make the story more interesting. It would, it would add a dimension to the character that you can either like or hate. Like Captain America. Well, how would he make it any more Captain America than make him homophobic? <laughs> no, yeah, you no. See what I mean, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. You, but th th again, it's about the f the thing being the focus of, of what is discussed. Uh, when I mentioned Marvel Man, for for people not aware, and I'm not especially aware, I just saw a video about that recently. Uh, I'm a fan of Alan Moore. Uh, I was not familiar with Marvel Man, but the idea of Marvel Man, which later was developed with Watchmen, was to have a telling a story of superhero with contemporary considerations We're trying mm -hmm. to to do uh, so but that again that's the focus that in Watchmen you've got characters who are racist who are eugenist, uh, mm -hmm. eugenist who, are, who, are, who are gay or not and the, the very first superhero in, Ma in Watchmen might of might not have been in the canon might not or have been a person of color might uh, not or have been uh, uh, gay but it's the point of it it's sort of the question of the what if what if captain america was homophobic but let's say it's not in the whole canon of um, captain america with all the, the baggage he's got it's a separate story of going that yeah. it's it's red sun it's the what if superman grew up in the soviet union and then you but that's the focus of your story. It's not. It's not a thing which hangs exactly. in the back. Exactly. So it, that's why it's. It, it really depends on how you want to do it and the reasons. The the, the, the true real reasons. Yeah. You have to actually want to do it. You know. But if it is to maintain historical accuracy, I think you know people. People who say that need to have a very hard look at themselves and be honest. Uh, think, about the reasons why they want to get it away. I think it's a problem of, uh, it's probably not the right word, but uh, kind of a school of role playing of universalism. Uh, and I think it's funny because it, it applies not only to ideas like that, of trying to, to cover everything at once, and at the same time you don't cover anything, and you, you keep stuff which, are, you, which don't, just don't belong in the story you're telling. But it's the same with system. Uh, as mm -hmm. I grow old, I'm more and more interested in games and systems which explore specific aspects of a story, of an experience, mm -hmm. rather than cover everything. Mm -hmm. Like like even Dungeons & Dragons does it, or GURPS, or different systems, and the idea is to try to cover everything, and you sort of create a simulation of life with numbers and percentages and you, you, you consider absolutely any job you could do in any circumstances. You, you cover people who are good at chatting up each other and you try to cover also people who are good at physical feats and you try to do superhero and regular people at the same time and keep them balanced. Uh, and yeah, it, does, it becomes meaningless because you're trying to do everything at once. I think it's much more mm -hmm. interesting. No, let's play specifically teenager superheroes and you got masks and it does that and it's not oh I want to play Japanese intrigue or even Game of Thrones intrigue that, that's a song of ice and fire or legend of the five ring and it covers your social interaction and lying to one another very well but it would cover super badly superhero powers and you know it's it's more interesting you got games which focus on one thing and yeah this this game mastering of trying this sort of world with a, some kind of integrity and you're married to the integrity of that world and that system in spite of telling something or not even telling something because we had this debate uh, online once uh, I don't even, I'm not even so much a story storyteller I'm more interested in the first person experience as a, as a player so I don't mm -hmm. even think it needs to be a story but it's about what emotions you're trying to convey to your player like, like uh, and again if you were playing something about racism or homophobia it would be this this feeling of being alienated with without good reason or you, you know rage or being yeah, helpless towards something more powerful than you, and certainly you wouldn't be doing that for 
for a year every week uh, <laughs> but you know it would be about you convey those feelings like or you go on the opposite of the spectrum you convey the feeling of you're a powerful superhero and you're the right guy and you're doing the or the right girl and you're doing the right thing Th that's the thing you lose yourself in being in, a, in another situation and but you cannot do it while being a game master like i mean if you do it having fun right for you as long as you're not promoting wrong ideas but yeah you're not a computer system you're, you're not simulating the matrix saying that water flows this way and the light reflects this way and uh, the physics of the world you're not a physics engine uh, using mm. a, a human brain well to me the the thing is though um I do like I do like the concept of, of transmitting um, um, emotion. What I like is to let people experience whatever they want to experience. I mean, for me, the story is uh, very important because it's the conduit I have to make people feel you know, when they're around the table, and um, and I do make them feel depending on what story I'm, I'm, I'm telling. For instance, um, one of the adventures that I'm going to design that. Um, I'm, I'm writing down, it's quite complicated to do this. Um, it's an adventure, it's a Cthulhu adventure that I play with my friends um, in complete darkness. Um, it has to be played in a room with absolutely zero light, and the only light they are allowed to use, and the game lasts for as long as their batteries in their phones last. Cool. That's all the time they have to play the game. And the only light they have is that the one that comes from the screens in their mobile phones. Because they are lost in a place without any kind of light and they don't have any torches. So the only thing that they have that can produce any light is that. So they know this before we jump into the game. Uh, of course, we have a, a lift, you know, a switch uh, near enough so, so we can turn the light on and things get a bit intense. Uh, and I have used a strobe light sometimes, and I have warned them. You know, some people have told me, no, no strobe lights for me, please. Uh, and some people say, don't jump scare me because I have a heart attack and that could kind of be dangerous to me. I say, okay, I'd rather not kill you, thank you very much. So what they feel throughout the adventure, that's up to them. I want, I know I want them to feel prescient. I know I want them to feel disorientated. How that makes them feel, you know, how, how do they feel when they finally find a room where something happens that gives them a glimpse to a past that they hate? That's up to them. Mm. That is entirely up to them. That, that's why I, I, when I design my adventures, I design them more to elicit very broad emotions, like claustrophobia or uh, fear or you know a sense of rush of pressure of stress you have to finish something very quickly that's why i like racing adventures you know things that if you don't do it within x length of days the world ends for instance i like that i don't know if you want how they feel about that that's up to them some people may feel very invigorated by the fact that they they are under pressure to do something some people may feel they are, you know, impotent and they have to find help in other players or the characters because they don't feel they're up to it. And sometimes they feel, you know, they are going to some sort of nihilist mode that, oh, you know, screw everything kind of thing. So that's why for me the story is what matters the most because what I want to give is the ingredients for the players to cook their own emotions. Um, so, whereas you go for something more specific, in my case, it's more like, I'm gonna give you a roast. You know, here's the chunk of meat, here's the spices, and you turn on the heat. I'm just going to tell you where the controls to turn the heat on and off in the cooker are. It's up to you how you use them. Yeah. It, it, yeah, no, it's. I mean, it's it's entirely fine. I, I'm not anti-story. It's just sometimes it it becomes really the focus of thing. I guess the, at the end of the day, what what it boils down to for me, it's it's a question of. I see game masters as curators, 
And what mm-hmm. matters to me for players is that players have choices of different experiences curated by different game masters. And uh, that doesn't mean it, there's no exchanges between the game masters and the players. But I, I'm more interested in having, I don't know, 10 game masters, cu- each curating something very different and specific and being interested in five out of the 10 experience they offer rather than having 10 game masters who uh, who do something which which will uh, be appropriate for everyone uh, in the group uh, I'm, I'm moving very far away and it's a it's a luxury because uh, there's no scarcity of tables available online and here in London but I'm moving away of playing with the same group all the time you know even mm-hmm. even as a game master so as a game master from one time to another I'm not running each time the same thing but if I'm running something I will I will cast my player I will work out w- which player will probably buy into what I, I want to do with with that one and uh, there's still a lot of this mentality and it's a bit a, of a, a taboo I find of yeah we have a game master in the village and it's our game master and we 14 or 12 years old and it's the only game master and we play everything with that game master and we stuck with that game master and the game master is stuck with us and so everybody's stuck and cannot explore things they might not enjoy all of them while we got the internet and yeah I mean yeah not everyone have the luxury of living in a big city where they, they got all the uh pros from being in the countryside but yeah it's it shouldn't be taboo to say to a game master you know what this table i don't think it's mine uh even before trying it or i tried it you know that's not my fun and it should be fine for a game master to to run a game and and not offer it first to his usual players all the time because maybe uh, she wants to try something else with other people uh it's still very taboo this oh no we need to play together all the time we we are all group and we are yeah it's not i mean <laughs> free love <laughs> free game mastering well you know i i i hear an open lot of this um fallacy that anybody's welcome on my table well no no, no. exactly no, no. No, no, that's that's just not true. I I absolutely adore my group. The, play, the, the people I play Dungeons and Dragons with on Fridays, when we are not in lockdown, absolutely love them. There are out of those, and we can be up to eight players, there are four that I would play Cthulhu games with. My Thursday group that we play Call of Cthulhu or Pop Cthulhu, I wouldn't play D&D with them. Is not the right table. They they want some more more intense more more you know yeah intense experiences. So with them I played Call of Cthulhu. I ran uh, Never Going Home uh, a few times for them and they loved it. But you cannot play everything with everybody. And changing tables and telling people you know I want to play this game because I want to experience so and so and so and so. And so. You know I wouldn't play intellect with everybody and everybody. But I have some friends at my gaming club and they are philologists. They love language. So when I told them about intellect, they were drooling. I mean, they, they were really all over it. They loved the idea, you know, a game about a language that's dying. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Boom. No, headaches. no, loved it. Can I play that with my friends on Fridays? No. No, I, I can't. And I don't like every game either. You know, um, what, what was it? It was in February, I think, that we played a, a, an adventure designed by one of my friends, and it was a Power by the Apocalypse system, and it was a bit, Power by the Apocalypse is just not something that gels with me very well. Uh, but okay, let's, let's let's try, let's have a go. And you know, yeah, I, I had a good time, but it wasn't for me. There is a game around in Spain called Inserso, in which you play uh, retired people, you know, you, you play the elderly who go on weekend trips organized by the government and they get into adventures. Um, I wouldn't play that game with people I don't know because we get into all sorts of incredibly inappropriate jokes because that's what the game has been designed to do. Would I play that in public? 
absolutely not. Would I play that with somebody, you know, in their 70s or 80s? No. Hell no. Ever. Ever. It's a comedy game. It's a very inappropriate game. We play it in a place where we feel is safe. Would I play with anybody? No. So, no, these, everybody's welcome on my table and I'll be playing anything. No, that's a lie. Sorry, it's, it's, it's incorrect. Yeah, it's not true. <laughs> I can't believe that. So I can understand what you're saying. And yes, everybody should be able to say, you know, guys, I want to play this. I don't think that you're the kind of people I want to play with. Yeah, I don't think you're going to take it seriously enough. I don't think that you're going to, you know, take it far enough. Or I think you're going to take it too far. So no for me. And that should be fine. Yeah. Okay, on that, uh, sadly, I, I'd love to continue chatting with you, but uh, my son's nap is already way too long and we're going to have trouble <laughs> putting him to bed tonight. So, uh, one last thing to plug and uh, where, can fi where can people find you? Uh, and this is, this is goodbye. Oh, right. Okay. Um, well, Twitter is the easiest place to find me because I'm there an awful lot of the time. Facebook, by all means, say hello. I'm always quite happy. Uh, I'm producing videos for the YouTube channel all the time. And of course, there's the website, GMS Magazine, every single one of those places to make it easy for everyone. Uh, and I genuinely look forward to hearing from people. Uh, I love interacting and, and chatting. So yeah, say, say hi. Yeah, and hopefully, well, I hope we'll interact till then, but uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, hug each other or at least keep our distances at Dragon Meet. Uh, I hope so. Let's uh, let's I, cross I, finger for that. Yeah, let's 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 hope that by then they will not have to, you know, cancel any more conventions. Um, you know, let's hope that Spiel is the last one they have to cancel. Hopefully. Well, thank you so much, Paco. And, uh, well, yeah, see you around. Thanks, everyone, who tuned thank in. Thank you for having me. And, uh, yeah, go check uh, our main show. Cheers. Bye.